Hello, and welcome to this Museum at Home webinar about Art of Nation. I'm Amanda Dennett, Head of Digital Experience at the Australian War Memorial. In 1919, official war historian and memorial founder Charles Bean sketched a design for the building that he envisioned would become the Australian War Memorial. For the first time, a digital world featuring his design has been created. In this webinar, we'll take a closer look at Australia's early war artists and photographers and explore the virtual art of nation. Our presenter today is Dr. Anthea Gunn. She completed a PhD in art history for her thesis, Imitation Realism and Australian Art in 2010 and uh, at the Australian National University. Dr. Gunn previously worked as a social history curator at the National Museum of Australia and joined the Memorials Art Section in 2014, where she's since curated a range of contemporary art commissions and exhibitions. Today, this is an interactive webinar. Please send us your questions by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of the chat window. Uh, and we'll try to answer as many as we can at the end of this presentation. Once again, welcome, and I'll now hand over to our presenter. Thanks, Amanda, um, and thank you all for tuning in. I know everyone's probably a bit sick of Zoom by this point in 2020. Um, so yeah, this project I'm really pleased to be able to share in this format. Uh, it was originally launched a few years ago, and then this year we've taken the opportunity to revisit it and just update it a little bit um, in line with 2020 technology standards. Um, and this is kind of the ideal way to share an online exhibition, really. So. Um, I'll jump in and just start sort of talking people through, but a little bit about um, the War Memorial Art Collection. Um, so the War Memorial itself has its genesis in the First World War. Um, the scale of suffering that that war unleashed on the world, but particularly for Australia, meant that we there was this need to create something large and that, in which we could actually remember all those who served. Um, and Charles B was at the very heart of it. So during the war, he was Australia's official war correspondent. Um, he'd been an established journalist, British Australian background. Um, was very committed to seeing, uh, shared a very common view at the time that Australia was going to prove itself in the First World War. This this young country, obviously on a very ancient land, um, was going to prove itself on the national stage, international stage, I should say. Um, and like many people, that view was just. He just learnt the absolute hard way that war was a terrible, terrible thing. Um, and so during the war, he was thinking about how on earth people at home are going to understand what their country folk have been through. And so what he, his idea was to have a national commemorative site where every individual that lost their life would be remembered, and it would accompany a museum and an archive where all the records would be kept and where people could come and actually understand the experience of war in order to truly commemorate. Um, and so part of that was establishing an art collection. Um, and so during the war, they started to deploy artists um, to battlefields, like a first-hand experience of the war. Um, and we ended up with a collection of about sort of 1,600 official war artworks um, from the First World War. And that's way too many to display. Our First World War galleries are large galleries for those that have visited. Um, but there's only about 100 artworks, including the dioramas. Um, that are on display at any one time. So we have this large collection, and so access is constantly one of the things that we're thinking about and how to actually give the public a way into this collection. And so team that with all the potential for digital technology, and this is where Art of Nation um, had its birth place. So in our um, coming to the War Memorial homepage, going to visit, into exhibitions, and then to online exhibitions, um, is where you can find Art of Nation. And then you just click through to that link. Um, and it's got a website with a bit of information about the project and then um, this image I'll just draw your attention to. This is Charles Bean's sketch of what he thought the Australian War Memorial would look like. Um, he was away from Australia for the entirety of the war um, and as he came home in 1919 on the ship he spent that time actually developing the plan for the War Memorial. So, and as part of that plan he came up with this sketch and it was just an idea, like obviously the actual War Memorial River building doesn't look anything like um, what Bean came up with. He had no issue with that. He wasn't completely wedded to his idea. But this sketch does tell us quite a lot of information about how Bean conceptualised this building. And not just Bean, he was you know, collaborating with a whole circle of people around him, um, notably John Trelaw, the Memorial's first long-term director. Um, 
And so, as you can see from the front of the facade, um, a very kind of neoclassical building, so very similar to existing galleries or libraries in Australia at the time, so the State Library of Victoria, Art Gallery of South Australia, Art Gallery of New South Wales, um, all following that kind of very classic style of European architecture, um, so it conveys a sense of importance. Um, Bean thought it should be surrounded by Australian natives um, to create this kind of salt and garden where people could come and reflect and have time um, to think about that. And then his floor plan inside the building. And this is, so the floor plan and the facade were key sources for Art of Nation. Um, he thought the art gallery would have a dedicated wing. Um, our art collection's never been displayed in this way. So this is one of the reasons that Art of Nation was a really interesting project for us, was to actually bring to life um, Ben's sketch and his vision for the art collection and actually see how it worked, because it's never been displayed in that way. Um, this museum space is the heart of the memorial, um, being envisaged that every name of the soldiers would be, or who served, sorry, of lost their lives, um, would be listed and then it would have where they were from, it would have a photograph of them, um, and it would have which unit they were in. That proved unrealistic to realise because finding all that information, not everyone had photographs, um, so of that idea evolved into what it was what we have now, where it's um, listed all individuals. It was always crucial that it wasn't by rank. So in death you were equal. There was no more important if you were a more senior um, service person. Um, and that's absolutely the principle that we have today. Um, and one of the things about this sketch is that Bean wasn't an architect, didn't pretend to be, and it was impossible to realise when we got to the architecture competition, which is why we have the commemorative area um, as we do today, as you can see behind us, um, with the roles of honour in the cloisters leading up to the Hall of Memory. There's never been a um, combination of museum objects with the commemorative area, which is just significant as how you experience the memorial. Um, and then I'll just jump in, but I'm going to skip that link just for the sake of both live TV. Um, and I'm going to switch tabs. So if you click that link on there, you would find yourself um, in this spot. I've just popped outside the building. Um, what we did when we did it digitally um, developed this, and I should acknowledge the project partners, um, Ortelia Interactives, who worked with us on this, um, was to build Bean's building on the site of the existing memorial, but in contemporary Canberra. So the idea is that this building was built in the early 1920s, um, and you're visiting it in the present day. So you can swing around and see the vista that is Canberra um, with modern Parliament House um, in the far distance and you can walk around this space and moving around is just as simple as just clicking around um, and so you can kind of get a just vague glimpses of the landscape of different ideas um, which I find unreasonably fun as someone who doesn't play video games and has a low expectation of technology um, and then when we were building this space we did have we did play around a little bit so we've returned the shallow mosaic um, to being a floor again which for those that have been to the memorial, um, it's embedded in a wall, and so it's just a way of actually engaging with this object in a different way to what we could ever do um, physically. And then all the images that you see around, you can click on them and bring up extra information. So it tells us a story of what the Shalala Mosaic is and why it's at the memorial. Um, one of the things that Bean would strongly object to is me putting him front and centre in this project. He was a very modest person, so he would never have wanted to be um, in this kind of prominence, but this gave us an opportunity to explain who he is um, and what his significance was to this project. This painting was painted by one of the official war artists, um, George Lambert. He and Bean had a really close relationship. They went to the Gallipoli together after the war to kind of, because the official war art scheme only started in late 1916 to 1917, they sort of missed Gallipoli, so they had to go back and, um, and explore those events of 1915 on site. Um, but it, it, it indicates one of the real priorities for this whole collection was that it had to be authentic, it had to be as close to historically accurate as possible. There was a huge premium placed on that, and that was one of the ways they wanted to honour and respect that those that had served, that they really wanted it to be um, as close to accurate as possible. Definitions of historical accuracy, of course, are a way bigger question. I've just managed to make myself upside down, which is one of the things that can happen. Um, as you can see, we've also left this um, central museum space empty, which is a little bit odd when you first walk in, I think. Um, but it was kind of us acknowledging that we didn't didn't quite feel right to try any kind of digital representation of the Royal Honor. I think it's a really important site and those individuals are really important 
And so to do that justice, it's kind of beyond the scope of what we could achieve in this project. But then it is envisioned that it would sit there yeah. in the centre as soon as you Exactly, so you walk in, memorial. and so it's yeah. similar to what actually happens when you arrive at the memorial, so yeah. you remember a barrier is straight in front of you, and you can go and see the names uh, on that. And so he imagined this huge space would be all the names with the photographs, um, and it's that was effectively worked out as kind of a measurement that, that would require, and that was what determined the whole scale of yeah. the whole building. Um, and so there's sort of a poignancy underlying just even the physical size yeah. of the building. Um, and then because it was going to be such a huge hall, um, he knew that there would have to be something in the centre, and so that's where they imagined having some of the really large technology objects that were brought back from the war, so some of the large artillery guns, aircraft, those kind of things, because that space would be available for that. Um, but they've never actually been displayed like that. Um, so going into the art gallery, it'll just kind of load up as, yep, there it goes. Um, so the frames for all the artworks are apparent. And so Bean's original idea for all the large paintings, so official war artists, there were ultimately 15, um, some who were already enlisted as soldiers um, who were deployed to become, who had art as their background, so they were able to actually use their artistic skills, which I imagine after periods of fighting on the Western Front would have been a profound relief to them. Um, and then some other artists were from Australian artists based in London, um, so they were more experienced artists. And there was this interesting kind of tension between Charles Bean's original vision was that you'd only be able to actually depict conflict if you had personal experience, which makes sense. Like, how could you possibly know? Um, but then there was this kind of ongoing conversation, which I'll talk a little bit about as we go, with um, some of the artists just not having the ex experience as artists in act to, to be able to depict that experience, and so the more experienced artists had a real value there. Um, so all the artists were deployed to the field. They were invited to create they're part of their contract, 25 field sketches um, in the field that could depict whatever they wanted. There was no kind of interference there, apart from some of the portrait artists who were told who they had to paint um, as their subjects. But then all the, all the artists could do whatever they wanted in the field, and then they were invited, they were commissioned to create large paintings, which are the paintings we see in this gallery, with the idea that they would collectively do what they're doing here, which is basically tell the story of Australians' experience of the First World War. Um, and so that starts up here with deployment up to um, what's now Papua New Guinea um, to defeat the German forces in the Pacific, Australia's role in doing that. Um, and then once the RAF was formed, setting out to sea, going to Egypt, um, and of course ends at the landing, um, George Lambert's crucial painting. As I mentioned before, he went deliberately with Bean, so this was created after the fact it wasn't his personal experience witnessing the landing. Um, and so this is one of the kind of iconic paintings in our collection that's always on display in our First World War galleries. Um, so creating it in this gallery kind of gives us a way of experiencing it in a different way um, and seeing it as part of a collection. Um, right from the memorial's first exhibitions, which were the first one was in the Royal Exhibition Building in Melbourne, um, it was the artwork was always displayed alongside other collection objects, including the photographs, dioramas, the weapons, uniforms, everything else. Um, so it's a mixed collection display. Um, and so the collection's never been displayed like we see it here. And so seeing it in this context allows us to kind of appreciate what the intent was for it as a collection being created, and also appreciate its strengths and weaknesses. Not all of the artworks, I think, aren't quite live up to what we might have hoped for. This being probably my most obvious example of that. Um, Henry Forward was a, a lovely artist for many reasons, but he, he just hadn't had much experience of creating large oil paintings. Um, there's a huge skill set in doing that, um, whereas some of the other artists really did. Um, Streeton being a fantastic example of that, kind of continuing his um, practice for which he was already a really well known Australian artist, painting landscapes around the Heidelberg School had gone to London to sort of make his fortune internationally. Um, and so when the war happened, he was sort of able to be quite relatively straightforward um, deployed to the front. Um, each of these large paintings has information about sort of the historical context of what's been depicted. Um, and then the official rights all link through the maps. Um, and so we can see on the map a selection of their works. 
um, and where they created them, so reconnecting what's been depicted to the site where it was created. And so I wanted to ask about that because not only can you see those plot points, which I think it um, really helps people you know, in this time and far away to connect with where these um, paintings or uh, photographs were created, but then there's also the opportunity to look at sort of a street view, so a current look at some of these sites. And so why, you know, why was the choice made to represent that? And, um, you know, what, I guess, what does that add to the, the collection that we haven't been able to do so far? Yes, yeah, so I think um, certainly, like, in your question, certainly for my generation, um, I grew up hearing about the First World War and mm. kind of mythologised later, I think, like, you know, there's so much about the living, it was so meaningful, so sort of poetic, but um, I wouldn't have been able to tell you where it wasn't about. Yeah. Um, and so, for me, this process really um, was valuable because it connects these specific images back to where that were made and what they depicted in the historical moment. Um, and then seeing Google Street View here of these places today, I also find really poignant because there's something I find um, really powerful about seeing images often of destruction, like we see here with the prom, um, and then how these places have been rebuilt. Yeah, and because it's sort of a life goes, yeah, it moves forward. Sort yeah, of exactly. Um, and, yeah. and also the choices people make. Um, so, obviously, the Citadel here, which is obviously a very important historic site in Koran, um, was chosen to be rebuilt as it was before. And that's one of the things, particularly in France, that I really noticed through this project is that um, because each of these works, we had to identify where they were from um, and what they depicted and where it was likely to be. And so, um, you'll notice I tend to pick, when I'm going jumping into Street View, I tend to pick buildings because they're the easiest to find. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, you can make a really quick comparison, whereas some of the vistas of mud that happened in the Western Front yeah. um, usually will have a title and have information. And we could get quite specific. Some of the others were amazing as far as um, well, there were a couple we found that actually have the first level map coordinates. Wow. So you could basically get down to a, like a couple of metres yeah. um, as to where that was. It's like having GPS coordinates now. And that often, they, they were the artists that were from that were soldiers, so yeah. they were dealing with that, all that information and, and that had become, the importance of that. Yeah. And that had become the kind of their language yeah. um, to talk in those ways, whereas some, it would just be in 1917. Yeah. And it's it's pretty big. <laughs> it's a lot of fun yes. at that point. Um, so, yeah, so there's that process was really interesting. Um, and I'm forever grateful to my colleagues who went along with me on the journey when I said, we're going to map the collection. Um, it took a while. Yeah, I'm sure, yeah. <laughs> but what's hugely valuable for our collection, because over time, I think one of the things I realised was just that um, for I think one to two generations, like, even after the war, um, you could still talk about these places with a huge degree of familiarity. People just knew what we were talking about when you mentioned the town name. They knew the battle that happened there. They probably had a good sense of um, where it was and how, what had actually happened. Um, whereas for me, you know, I knew Provence a first world war town. Um, but I wouldn't have been able to tell you it was part of the Hindenburg line campaign. I wouldn't have been able to tell you where the Hindenburg was, um, that Peron was an allied strong, uh, sorry, a, a German stronghold right up to the end of the war. So there was this huge triumph in making it to Peron. Mm. That was one of the you know, signs the war was definitely ending um, and that victory was in sight um, at such enormous cost. And so for me, this actually was also just a different way into military history. Honest, I'm um, um, well, likely to pick up Charles Bean's multi volume history of the First World War as a you know, recreational reading. Yeah. Whereas something like this is a different way into a very complex mm -hmm. history and a very complex set of events. And it's also visual, which works well with art. Um, and so, one of the other things that we did was provide this thing where you could look at all the war artists. So, you could see all the artworks that we've mapped in this, it's usually 25 per artist, so it's a bit less than the whole collection. Um, you get this kind of instant grab of where were Australians in the war, and you can kind of look at this and see um, as a sort of instant data visualisation that this is where Australian artists created, the official war artists created artworks, so that's where Australians were serving. Um, it kind of maps onto that, so it's some really quick ways of, I think, learning some things without realising you're learning them, if that makes sense. Um, and then one of the things I like about it as an art curator too is that it gives us this um, proximity to actually explore different representations of the same site. Um, so we could see some of the other artists and I 
most of myself there. There we go. It's back on put on. And so James Fraser Scott, who was one of the AIF artists, um, doing an, an image of the um, Citadel, and Louis McCubbin, um, who goes on to work on the Dublin Islands and do some really important work for the memorial in that sense. And so there's this sort of history of the collection involved. But that, again, that also tells us the fact that all the artists that visited um, Rome through the Citadel. Um, so this is a kind of instant, sort of intuitive understanding of oh, that's clearly important. Yes. Um, and so it's just, I think, trying to make um, something that is hopefully engaging for people to sort of explore and just click on things randomly, pretty much, but you sort of learn intuitively as you do that about what artists were doing and, you know, perhaps why they were doing it. Um, yeah, so, again, so the artists were deployed um, sort of from 1917 into 1918. Um, they'd be deployed for three months at a time, um, and often it was an AIF artist and um, one of the artists, the non-AIF artists, who were deployed by the High Commission in London as civilians um, with temporary deployments. And so there's also this really, I think, not particularly well understood, but quite lasting consequences for Australian art history. This is the first time the federal government has done any kind of large-scale art commissioning pro program. The only sort of uh, federal collection at that point was the parliamentary one of portraits of uh, politicians. And so this is the first time we've done any federal museum collection. So it actually has this sort of hugely important significance for Australian museum history. Um, and so one of the things, just sort of coincidentally, is that artists like Longstaff, um, who is kind of best known, I think, for going on to create Midnight at Menengate in 1927, um, during the war, he'd served in the IAF. Towards the end of the war, he was deployed um, as an artist, and so and he was deployed alongside Street. So he had this opportunity to see work for three months with one of the best known Australian artists, um, and you can really see that I think in his style that he starts to um, really learn from some of Street's um, techniques. And so they do. There's some overlapping works that they do similar subject matter, um, and I think. With some of Longstaff's work, you can really start to kind of get a feel for how Streeton handled um, watercolour in particular. Um, I don't think Longstaff ever did it to the same sort of level of brilliance that Streeton did, to be perfectly honest, but um, there is this sense where you can start to kind of see these works in a way that we don't in the galleries because we can't just, so, you know, the space is always at such a premium, we can't just display four views of the same thing, alas. Um, so there's all these sort of other elements to the um, complexity of the official war art scheme that would completely overdo it if we displayed them in the galleries here, but are really interesting to explore and this technology kind of allows that to happen. One of my favourites is always Will Dyson. Um, he was our first official war artist. He was a really significant um, Australian in London before the war. He'd established himself as a cartoonist. Um, in the press and was creating these incredibly pointed cartoons about the war. So this one um, is a strong example of that, um, which is called Stepping Stones to Higher Things. Um, and so it was about basically politicians using horrific war to ascend to their personal goals. Um, and so incredibly pointed, scathing, biting commentary on the war. Um, and then at the same time, he decided that he wanted to be um, an official war artist. So living in London through this time, he was meeting all of the troops in the AIF and he was hearing about what they were going through. And he was hearing about you know, the reality of the Western Front and he wasn't seeing that in the press. He kind of saw these quite light-hearted, black humour, which is, you know, a very common way of dealing with problems, but for him, he found it a bit offensive that civilians were talking about it in this way because they weren't experiencing it. And so he wanted to create this record for Australia. Um, he'd been in London since 1909 but he still had very strong connections to Australia, very strong sense of this as a nation-forming event for us. Um, and so he wanted to create this record. So he writes to the High Commissioner and offers his services, um, basically free of charge, just kind of getting him access to it, and, um, transportation. And then every drawing he did was going to be property of the Australian government. So whereas every other artist was commissioned for three months, 25 sketches, he was pretty much open-ended. It ended up being kind of renewed every six months to the end of the war um, with hundreds of coming to the um, collection. And it's fair to say he was never properly recompensed for that. Um, 
complexities of starting an art collection in the middle of a war might meant that the administration was no idea. Um, but he had this real, um, he, so he arrived on the Western Front in December of 1916. Um, Charles Bean basically met him and pretty quickly Bean could see in Dyson's approach that um, Dyson was genuine, that he understood and that a civilian artist could actually depict um, the events that were happening around them. This was one of um, his early works, which this isn't a great image of, I'm not quite sure what happened there, but anyway, um, coming out of the song. So after the troops had been um, at the front line for several several days, um, so basically in the trenches during winter, 1916 was one of the worst winters that France had seen um, for generations, they would then trudge back um, behind the lines, so coming out means coming out of the trenches, um, and arrive for a few days rest. Um, and at this point they were doing that in Mont Arbon, which was this tiny town that had been fought over in summer. So basically they'd been pretty much raised to the ground um, and was now kind of your rest line. So it's just, the whole thing was just bleak. It's just mud. You can see these guys, their dejected posture. They've just, yeah, they've just walked for about six kilometers through these terrible conditions. Um, and now they're going to have at least a few days break from the war, but they're not going to escape the war. They're still going to be in this kind of awful landscape. Um, and so again, being able to reconnect it to the place, and I don't know this is exactly where those guys were, of course, um, but they come from sort of this direction. And there's something, I don't know, probably says a bit much about me, but this is something I find really comforting about the fact that this is all now potato fields. Um, just feels like, yeah, nature is healing. We're growing potatoes again. We'll put it into 2020 parlance. Um, yeah, so being able to explore it in this way, for me, there's all these kind of personal associations I think you have and the kind of understanding of what war means and what it does to people and their experiences. Um, for me, yeah, working on this collection is just is such a privilege. Um, and being able to kind of contextualise that. And someone like Dyson who just knew what he was doing and why he was doing it, um, but he wanted to create this lasting record for his country such a kind of clear tribute to the soldiers and it just came across in everything that he did. So pretty quickly um, having arrived in the middle of this winter, it's probably the low point of the war, people just did not know when trench warfare was going to end, it just seemed to be grinding on forever. But, um, we were just facing off across these trenches and no one was going anywhere. Um, so he started to create a book about that, um, Australians at War, which for various reasons wasn't published till later, mostly due to the availability of paper. Um, but works like this, so bringing up the stew, um, he really kind of just zeroes in on what's important to people um, at this time. Um, and food is just absolutely crucial. Um, and then I'm going to start speeding up because I just really looked at the time. Um, and then one of the other things too is that he very rarely depicts death. Very few of the artists actually do because it's obviously really, it's so many sort of ethical considerations about depicting a dead body. Um, and certainly with the photographers, you know, they're going back to um, you know, being published in the press, they had to be really careful because the last thing you want is someone just recognise someone in a photograph like that. Um, and so, this is probably Dyson's um, main depiction of a dead body, and it's clearly fictionalised. Um, so it's sort of updating the wild colonial boy, which you know, I know is a, originally an Irish and then later Australian folk song. Um, the wild colonial boy is scorned to live in slavery, bound down with iron chains, would fight but not surrender until he received a more so he's using it as a kind of, um, you know, that really familiar poem as um, or song as a, um, a way of addressing the subject matter without it being yeah, too kind of realistic and confront confrontational. And then super quickly, I'm just going on to the other half of the building. Um, so my colleagues in photography um, have done a similar thing with the First World War official photography collection. One of the things before I sort of throw to questions and more discussion um, is just to bring your attention to this composite animation. So Frank Hurley, slightly controversially with his relationship with Charles Burnett, which I won't go into, um, liked to create these large composite images, which I find really fascinating because this print is massive, so you can see in the sort of scale here. Um, I don't think we think about photography in this era being this massive. Um, and 
but for Hurley having been to the battlefield and seen these events happen, um, to actually get one frame that captured all of the events was just impossible. Um, and so he worked more like an artist in that he constructed his images, so took multiple negatives and then actually built uh, one large image of that to create an overall impact. Um, and so this animation actually kind of unpacks the techniques behind that, which are really complex darkroom processes, but pretty exactly kind of match onto what Photoshop does today, but um, just using way more time. Um, so yeah, that's just a really personally interesting thing that I always have to draw people's attention to because I really like it. Um, Thank you, Anthea. That's a really great overview. Um, so I wanted to invite people once again to send in some questions using the um, chat or Q&A buttons at the bottom of your window uh, and we can discuss your questions now. Uh, but I wanted to kick off by just asking um, firstly um, about the styles of the artists that we've seen. So. Dyson, Streeton, and then finishing up with Hurley. So not only, I guess, different um, mediums, but also just vastly different styles. So um, you've covered briefly how some artists came to be chosen, but did their style come into it? Was it their availability? Um, and I guess what benefit does having that diversity of styles bring to our collection today? Yeah, so um, all of the above. Um, their styles were hugely important. Um, you can see just from the vast majority of those paintings that they're very traditional. Um, they were looking for artists that could create big history paintings, which is one of the most traditional forms in European art, um, and a very kind of explicit language as well that um, most European nations would commission or otherwise obtain massive paintings about their own kind of foundation moments. It was a really established way of asserting this is who we are as a country. And, and the display, the displays within Art of Nation are very traditional, yeah. you know, European yeah. art, art gallery yeah. displays. Exactly, and that is a particular language of actually saying, here we are as a nation, this is what we've done, this is how we kind yeah. of came into being, if you like. Um, and so you can just see that there's a series of choices that have gone into that, that this is the, the, the event. Um, and that location of the building too, that's on this axis with the Australian Parliament, um, if you go back to the original uh, Walter Burley Griffin and Marion Mahoney Griffin plans for Canberra, um, this site <laughs> has labelled casino on there, which I always find kind of entertaining, but then have to acknowledge that it's not casino as we might imagine it today. Yeah. Um, it was meant to be kind of like a pleasure ground. Canberra was dry then, you couldn't drink, but this would be a place where you came to on a Sunday afternoon and listen to music. And so for me again, like it's that one can see that I keep coming back to, where prior to the war, um, this was going to be a place of pleasure. And Australia was a place where you could come to this delightful, relaxing place and look down on our parliament um, and enjoy the camera blazing heat or freezing cold. Um, and yeah, but because of the war, it became a completely different mood. And that has a really profound change on this axis that was already planned for the national capital that will become a commemorative site. And associated with that um, is that it was only going to be about the First World War. There was that absolute certain hope and belief that this would be the last war that needed to be acknowledged in this way. Um, and of course that's not the case. And so kind of revisiting that moment for Bean's planning for the memorial, he's also visiting what he thought how history would unfold, that the Second World War wouldn't have happened, we wouldn't have had all these other conflicts and it was like, yeah, we've done war. Um, anyway, going back to your actual question <laughs> about the different styles. So yeah, the, very consciously embodying that language of traditional art. Um, other countries that had official war artists, including Britain, um, had more modernist artists because, of course, modernism was well up and running. Picasso was doing abstraction um, by this point in history, but it was, there weren't many Australian artists doing that. It was a much more traditional kind of art world and conservative taste, um, but deliberately conservative. Bean certainly wasn't having a bar of more modernist artists being appointed. And so that language of being able to depict figuratively traditional mediums. And, but then Dyson is really interesting because he doesn't kind of fit into that. But in many ways, he and Charles Bean become really close. He, um, Dyson's a little more, seeing more of a war than any of the other official artists. And it, part of basically Bean's travelling group. And so they're going around together and depicting things together. So it's quite unusual to have a graphic artist, someone who's drawing rather than painting. Yeah. Um, 
And I think, and that kind of plays into his long-term reception too. So in his artworks like Anzac the Landing, in Art of Mending Gate, those big oil paintings that become iconic in a way that Dyson has a historic importance, but he yeah, doesn't have that, his works aren't iconic in that same way. Um, and so his, his techniques capture different things and it's much more of a kind of, um, I think Dyson's genius was capturing the sort of day-to-day -day experience of the war not a heroic battle scene, but capturing something of the sense of just enduring. And yeah. I think enduring in those conditions was truly heroic. Mm. Um, and that's not necessarily what we associate with the word heroic. Um, so I did have a question about that, which um, I guess just relates to um, the variety in what is um, featured in the work. So. Um, you know, you showed earlier just some quite beautiful landscapes of um, the Somme yeah. to um, buildings of importance and then, you know, um, glorious battles such as the, um, the Hurley composite work yeah. um, and then uh, also some of those day-to-day -day depictions. So you mentioned that there was a level of um, autonomy for artists in choosing that, but, you know, why, why the beautiful landscape or, you know, because that is quite, um, I, I guess, maybe harking to their traditional works, but, you know, why why do we need works like that yeah. in the collection? Yes, it's a great question because there's a whole bunch of things going on there. Um, so one of the things is that the artists knew they were effectively doing research for big paintings afterwards. Um, so one of the reasons they went and did some landscape studies was that they knew historic moments that they depicted would be settled in that landscape. Um, Part of it was also that the artists were encouraged to play to their strengths. So a landscape artist like Spring would go and create landscapes. Um, and then some of the other artists, um, so Fullwood is great when I sort of disparage and refer to his big oil painting. Um, his field sketches are fantastic because there's these lovely sites of just all different sort of settings in which these soldiers were living. So there's all these people like camping in woodlands or living in chateaus or you know, all these kind of day-to-day -day moments, which really brings to life the actual lived experience of being in the ARF. It's not all in the trenches. There were so many people behind the lines, you know, headquarters, that kind of experience. But also the, when you were away from the trenches, well, where were you? And often you were camped in woodlands according to full descriptions. Mm -hmm. So there's both a combination there of like real historic detail that we wouldn't necessarily have visualised. These are the only colour photo colour images we have of the wall. Colour photography mm -hmm. wasn't well advanced at that point. Um, and so there's, there's that historic record, but there's also that research record. Um, An artist like Street too, even in his large battle scenes, superficially they just look like landscapes. Mm. Um, and then you sort of look closely and you can see what's going on. But that's part of Street's practice because he used landscape as a language. And so his Australian work prior to the war, um, he would you know, depict this beautiful settled pastoral Australia. But that's a very particular vision, like it's creating it particular message in the 19th century about Australia as this settled, pastorally prosperous land. It was a deliberate message that people wanted to send. There are other stories you can tell about Australia, mm. particularly about the settlement. Um, and so when he got, goes to the war, he's doing the same thing. He's using landscape as a language. So, he's, so he positions the war field in this beautiful natural vista. And so you can kind of start to pick up these ideas of sort of romantic symbolism that he um, used throughout his work where nature itself is communicating to us and so he's, you can draw inferences from that that nature will continue on, that these events will pass, um, that nature will heal and um, we will go on, we will be victorious um, in that way. And so he, and he uses shadows in really interesting ways too, so that there will be a cloud shadow on the landscape and that will be the German territory and so this beautiful sun that land is the land of the Allies and so yeah, there's all these kind of associations going on there. Um, and that's one of the strengths of the collection, is that different artists are doing things in different ways. And so we can see that variety of experience. Of course, one of the other I think, pretty obvious things now as we look at this collection is that it's a very particular view of war. Um, and I think it comes from the fact that people like Ben Trouble just had lived experience amongst it for 40 years. They were so, in some ways, their experience of it was quite narrow because it was very much focused on the battlefields. They didn't have a home front experience, they didn't have the experience um, of families losing people mm -hmm. um, and being at a distance from it. Um, and this isn't a criticism of anyone, it's just what it was. Um, and so I think if we were to do a similar collection today, 
God forbid, where they need to. Um, it would just be natural to do it. And you can see in the Second World War, the progression is there, that there are depictions of um, home front activities, women's experiences in particular. Um, women artists are deployed, whereas First World War is only male artists. Um, yeah, there isn't the diversity of even the AIF then um, with Indigenous service people. All of those stories aren't there. Um, and that's just part of time. So, you know, we have different understandings over time. It's one of the fantastic things about working here is that we have we keep building this collection. Um, Art of Nation only presents the official war art to explore that original vision for the memorial. Um, it's not how the memorial should be by any stretch of the imagination. So we've had a question from Brian uh, about the paintings that are depicted in Art of Nation. Yep. So Brian's asked, does the gallery include all of the paintings in the memorial's collection from the First World War? Um, and if not, how were the, how were the pictures selection, selected? Thank you, Brian. That's a great, great question. Um, so no, it's not every painting. It's most of the big paintings from um, the official war artist. And it's most of the paintings that were on Bean's list. Um, so over time, um, Bean and others con con collaborated on this list of the key moments of the war um, that would need to be depicted. So obviously the landing um, through to the battles um, of 1918, all the key sort of his moments of battle, along with works that kind of acknowledged um, some of the behind the scenes logistics roles. But it was never quite as straightforward as I've just made it sound. Because <laughs> there were different lists over time. Some of the works on the lists weren't actually painted. Some of them were, but they didn't really work out that well. Um, and so there were various kind of, uh, it's an interpretation of what was a plan. And I think the intent was clear that it would be that big gallery of um, paintings that depicted Australia's experience of the war. Um, but actually, the specifics of that were, of course, much more complex than, um, yeah, that sounds. So, yeah, it's pretty close. Um, so, one thing that um, I was thinking about as you were talking us through Art of Nation earlier was you touched on. Um, some of the works from 1914-15, and so official war, art, war artists weren't deployed until 1916. Yeah. Um, but of course, some iconic moments in Australia's military history occurred before that. So Gallipoli, you know, the one that kind of most people would think of. Yeah. And so, how um, how did those works come about? So if they're depicting those moments as people were there. Um, how were they able to create those retrospectively? Yeah. So. Um, Lambert's a great case in point because he goes on um, what being called his historical mission to Gallipoli. So one of the first things, which I get again, I find it extraordinary, so one of the first things being did at the end of the war was start planning to return to Gallipoli. Um, you can imagine how desperate he was to get home, just not be in the war, but he knew, because he'd already started working on the official history and he'd started working on the museum collections, he knew that there were these gaps and then he knew he needed to revisit that and understand that. Um, so he arranged for himself and photographer um, and um, Lambert as an artist They'd be part of a group that all went there together and explored it and um, talked to some of the tur tur Turkish soldiers, so the former enemy, um, to actually understand the campaign and have a proper understanding of it so they could achieve their plans. So Lambert had already been deployed to Palestine. He'd already displayed um, an aptitude and ability for the painting, but also had a real appreciation for the accuracy of the detail, which Bean was passionate about. So he and Lambert got along really, really well. I think he was probably um, Bean's second favourite artist after Dyson. Um, he probably didn't quite make them as explicitly as that. Um, and so they all go back. Um, of course, it's a form of battle sign, so it's awful because the other thing that's happening is that the War Graves Commission are at work. So they're um, sort of disinterring bodies and establishing cemeteries, really just confronting the traumatic things to witness even after the war. Um, and so um, Lambert was basically exploring the fields, understanding where the battle happened. And this is, you know, writes to his wife about sitting there on this cold, windswept hillside. He was there kind of early in the year, so still in winter. Um, and, you know, beside him, someone is working on this interior body and um, preparing it for a proper burial. Um, and so he, there was just no way for him to miss the significance of what had happened there and the importance of it and what it actually meant in terms of the cost to humanity. Um, and so he was drawing this, the scenery to understand. Um, the sort of actual yeah, the physical reality of that site, which 
for a painting of that size is just crucial. Um, when you look at that painting, you can actually see, see if I'm still there. Am I still sharing my screen? No. Um, sorry, I'll just confuse everyone momentarily if you'll bear with me. Um, yeah, so I'll just come back out of that. Rather than me describing the painting to you, I will show it to you. So here we are. Um, so Lambert kind of sat in this position and painted um, this landscape, and he's compressed it slightly. If um, people that have been there have pointed this out to me, whereas um, you can see the actual beach where they landed um, here, and then up to the sort of hillside. So he's compressed that landscape to actually get it all into. Um, frame and actually tell that story. So he's made these aesthetic choices in how to depict, which is one of the privileges that artists have. Um, it's much easier for them than photographers. And then one of the things too that I think particularly apparent in this kind of resolution of um, the image, but it's the landscape that kind of jumps out at you about this painting. It's not like Napoleon um, crossing the mountain ranges and it's about Napoleon as an individual and as a sort of historic and heroic figure. Um, here it's the landscape and then it's the troops kind of merging with it, swarming their way up um, the hill. And so it's a collective experience um, in this sort of inhospitable environment. Uh, and it looks quite foreboding, the, yeah. the landscape in that image. Yeah, and if you think, you know, being referred to this painting, like he had to write to people and get official permission for Lambert to visit because it was still held by military forces. Um, and in those letters he refers to this painting as the national picture. Um, so there's this already the sense that this moment is this crucial moment in the formation of Australia. So it's really interesting to me that um, this is the way he chose to depict it, that it's not kind of, and I think it just speaks to the culture of the AAF in many ways and Australia more broadly, is that it was about the ordinary soldiers, it wasn't about a particular heroic leader, um, and it was about what these guys did in being able to see this landscape and appreciate what it would be like to try and climb this under machine gun fire. Um, is just horrific to imagine. And so it's a complete inversion of what I was talking about earlier with um, you know, history paintings and these heroic moments in the nation's um, establishment. This is a completely different type of historical event that went with that. Um, and so, yeah, so for Lambert, he was absolutely dedicated to getting the details. Um, there are a couple of things that when you look at this painting close up, you can see like there's a lot more slouch hats than were actually worn on the day. And there was this kind of just sort of combined decision that. It was just right that the slouch hats be there because by that point they were so iconic um, for the AOF. Um, and he had like soldiers sort of posing. So when you look at each of these figures, they're all different. Um, it's not just kind of like a plastic soldiers that he replicated across the canvas, of course. Um, so he had people wearing the uniforms and posing. So we have all these sketches in the collection as well um, of that he drew, like figure studies preparing for that. So this painting took years to. Um, Create. You can sort of see the dates here, it's 1920 to 22, so it's well after the fact and it took a long time to paint. He'd come back to Australia by that point and was working in Sydney painting it. Um, and so it was this huge piece of work and some of those paintings, um, an artist would finish them and then former soldiers would come and look at them and then they'd kind of offer their critiques. Um, and then so it was on some instances, not with Lambert so much, artists were asked to change mm -hmm. paintings and correct them, but of course these were historic events involving thousands of people, so there are just different memories that people have, which is what I was referring to right at the start about you know, different points of view on history and different experiences of it. It's really hard often to be definitive about what something in particular looked like at a precise moment in time. Um, and so the artists had yeah, huge challenges in um, actually creating these works. So we've got time for just a couple more questions. Uh, and I suppose as an extension of that one, so that's an example of creating a work after the fact, um, simply because we didn't have an artist there at the time. But um, can you describe sort of briefly what, what is the, the process? How did most artists work? Were they sketching on the spot with the aim of then painting something quite quickly afterwards? Did anyone paint on the spot? Is that completely unreasonable? Did, um, and, and how is that in the First World War compared to perhaps how artists might work today or have worked in subsequent conflicts? Yeah, so at the time there was a combination of things going on. Um, so none of them painted like massive paintings in the field, just practicalities of that impossible. Mm -hmm. um, 
they had varying levels of access, often just depending on where they were at particular moments. And there was kind of a sort of really needed a confluence of history for an artist to be there right when a really significant battle happened, um, because of course they didn't always know ahead of time yeah. when something massive was going to happen or where you should stand to get a good view of it. And the nature of um, trench warfare too is that it happened over a broad, you know, it's not just one point where the key action happened. So they're incredibly difficult logistically to depict. Um, and so the artists tended to be assigned to like headquarters and then could sort of travel around in wherever that um, unit was posted. Um, and so they could get different perspectives. And so that's a lot of the field sketches feel like they're building up a picture of what the different elements were that were involved. Um, and so they tended to use whichever mediums were their preference. So some of them pencil on paper, um, some of them Often it's really quick sketches, the pencil or charcoal in a sketchbook to get kind of notations down almost, taking notes, and then they would go and do um, more detailed the, the actual field sketches that I was showing before um, with, um, you know, watercolours and so on. So work on that while they're in the field, but they're back at sort of wherever they're staying. Mm -hmm. um, so not literally in the field. Um, and then they would take those field sketches back to their studios, which were generally in London, the AF artists had um, big studios on Horse Ferry Road where the AOF was headquartered. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's when I was doing most of the big history paintings. So they'd sort of produced their 25 after, you know, they've, they've collected, done all their research yeah. and then produced yeah. them the 25 after. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, and so is that um, quite similar to today just because of the practicalities? Or uh, photography is one yeah. of there. So these days, pretty much every artist we send as an official or art commission. Um, so most recently, Megan Cope. Um, we'll just create hundreds or thousands of photographs, yeah. videos, um, yeah, and that becomes the reference point. Yeah, yeah, so that's more the reference point. Some artists still do sketch, but often they do, and a lot of artists think visually, so mm -hmm. sketching for them is often quite um, a way of thinking things through on the field. Um, ben Quilty did quick sketches of um, the soldiers that he met while he was in um, Afghanistan. Um, so there's still variety, but photography is way more central, it's how people are making their visual sort of yeah. diary at the time, um, which, yeah, I think the first world of artists would have been pretty jealous of yeah. being able to do that. Um, so for our final question, I just wanted to touch on the contribution that um, the artworks on display in Art of Nation um, add to um, not only the memorials collection, but I guess the telling of our history um, as the Australian experience of war, but also, I suppose, the contribution to um, you know, the global history of the war. So you showed quite briefly a work that was from New Guinea, and I wondered particularly about the Pacific uh, or some of those other um, conflict areas where Australia was perhaps one of the lead forces. Do those provide some of the only um, kind of windows into what was happening in those places? Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, so um, definitely First World War and Second World War as well, um, especially because there's so much more action in the Pacific then. Um, those records are crucially important. Um, they do; they are clearly Australia's experience and Australia's viewpoint. But um, like one of my colleagues, Garth O'Connell, um, has this makes this wonderful comparison between some of the Australian official war artist depictions of Singapore in the Second World War and the Japanese official war artists, and they're literally looking at the same road. Um, it's our dream to be able to bring those paintings together mm -hmm. and display them. That would just be amazing. And so it offers what is a global event, but a particular country's experiences, it's their experiences, but then the potential to revisit those um, collections today is quite profound. So um, with the sort of First World War works I was showing before, um, in um, it was German uh, New Guinea. Mm. It was on the lands of a taller people. Um, and so we were working with Gideon Kakabin, who's an amazing historian um, of the Tolloi, to actually reconnect those landscapes to his people's experience. Because he could look at those paintings and do a read the landscape and talk to us about it in way more detail than what we could possibly look to. Um, sadly, he passed away, which was just a real tragedy, both for him as an individual, but also for us, because he was such a, you know, it was amazing his starting that project. And so there's so much potential with this collection to keep doing that because these histories are international, they are global, they're incredibly complex um, and they're kind of, you know, these records are made at a particular time, these artworks and the artists are doing these particular things, but the potential to revisit them and look at them in different ways and make different understandings and keep 
understanding law and its consequences um, never more nuanced ways will just never end. Um, and I think it's always interesting telling people I'm an curator here because um, for this, it goes right through from, oh my god, the Paul Memorial Park collection is amazing, or like that, um, to, oh, art. Ah. Um, and people just haven't thought about it. Yeah. But if you actually think about these galleries without art, so no dioramas, no more memory, um, none of the paintings, it basically strips it out and kind of makes it um, a much more kind of technical museum. Like yes. It's much more about sort of um, military um, equipment. But yeah. art is one of, only one, but one of the key ways in which it makes it a much more um, kind of richer experience. And represents the world. human and um, the human element exactly. and, and the emotional story, I guess, yeah. having it interspersed with some yeah. of the object, other exactly. objects on display. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so I think even for visitors that don't sort of consciously stop and articulate, well, that is a painting and this is how it fits into art history, um, it still changes your experience of the spaces and the relationship with the objects mm -hmm. around it, which is one of the fascinating things for me as a curator to work with. Um, you know, I trained as a specialist in Australian art history, and so getting to work here alongside other specialists of completely different disciplines. Mm -hmm. Um, is and with subject matter of this importance um, and complexity. Yeah. Can't ask more than that. Well, thank you. So that brings our webinar to a close today. Um, thank you to Dr. Anthea Gunn for speaking to us about Art of Nation and Australia's um, uh, war, uh, official war art and photography collection from the First World War. Uh, if you don't already follow us on social media, please search for the Australian War Memorial on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn and YouTube to see more of our content. And of course, um, you can find this webinar on YouTube um, in the coming days um, and we'll share it on social media as well. Thanks again for joining us and goodbye for now. <laughs>